what is up my youtube family welcome back to my channel if this is your first time here then it's just welcome to my channel go ahead and hit the subscribe button because you will not be disappointed or at least i don't think so i don't know where your taste level is at so i cannot really say so today's video is going to be unlike any other video that you've seen on the channel or youtube at all however it is not a concept that you have probably never seen before in your life. Especially if you, like me, were once a fan of this old show called Beyond Belief Fact or Fiction. Do you know what I'm talking about? You know that show? If so, you are already familiar with the layout of this video and how this is going to go. And if not, it was a show that used to come on TV a long time ago where they would show four stories. And you, as the viewer, had to guess which stories are based on actual true events and which ones are just the product of the writer's imagination. We got to see each of the stories play out and then you would guess, like, is that real? Was that a real story or was it not? And at the end of the show, the host would reveal which stories are in fact based on true events and which ones are completely fiction. Every Friday night, my Aunt Latanya, shout out to you if you're watching this or if you know my auntie, love her she will put this show on when she got off work on friday nights we will watch it together make our guesses as the stories unfolded and in the end we will see which one of us got the most correct it was the highlight of my week for a period of my childhood it is still a highlight of my childhood actually so hopefully those of you who watch my videos with loved ones can have a similar experience and enjoy this just as much as i used to because that is what we are going to be doing here today. Or you're going to be doing it because mother already knows the answers. I know which stories are based on fact and which ones are completely fiction. So without further ado, let's get into story number one. And if you got some wine like me, girl, get into that too. Or whatever your vice is. In 2012, 24-year-old Joy is mourning a huge loss after a tragic house fire takes a blaze during the night while she is working late. And unfortunately, her husband does not wake up in time to escape the fire. Now, she is understandably having a very difficult time adjusting to her new life. And she feels like a huge part of this is having to drive the same exact streets that she had been in all of her life that she planned on being in forever with her husband raising a family of her own. Furthermore, she has never anticipated being a single mother to their five-year-old son, Jacob. Now, months after the incident, she decides that a good move for her and her son is to just relocate, go somewhere else, start fresh and new. So she randomly selects this small town right outside of Nashville, packs up her five-year-old son, Jacob, and the two of them relocate. They settle into this small, modest two-bedroom home, but it is more than enough space for her and her son. Plus, the landlord has written this place out for a price that you can't be with a stick, child. She felt lucky to even have found such a deal. The only thing that makes her uneasy is the landlord himself. The look in his eyes when she talks to him is just weird. He just has this strange aura about him his overall demeanor from the very first time that they met was just odd every exchange with him is nothing short of awkward but her interactions with him are always limited so she just puts it in the back of her mind furthermore he doesn't come off like a creep or somebody that will potentially hurt her or her son he just always seems uncomfortable when they speak confused even almost as if he found her to be the one that was weird Nevertheless, she settles into the home. She begins nesting, making it her own. And the first couple of weeks are really good. She's actually feeling a little bit better and feeling like this move was exactly what they needed. Joy is even beginning to feel more like herself before, you know, the incident. She's even making regular contact with her sister who felt like her next move should have been therapy versus moving across town. But Joy wanted to do her own thing. And so her sister allows her to do so. Joy is like, I got this. I'm making strides on my own. Joy is more concerned about her son, who overall appears to be adjusting well to their new environment, but he has developed a new habit of creating these imaginary friends, which he had never had before. She would hear Jacob all the time playing with his toys and talking as if he's in a whole conversation, full-blown conversation with someone else, except, of course, Jacob's voice is the only one that she hears. She asks him, who he's talking to and he tells her that there is a girl who lives inside the house with her grandmother. 
when the joy came see now at first she felt it was a little bit creepy but then she thought well you know what kids are kids like this is a normal thing i had imaginary friends too i was a strange child so it is a thing furthermore he's gone through a lot he's lost his father he's been uprooted and so she's like maybe this is just a coping mechanism and nothing to worry about maybe he's just trying to make friends because he's lonely even if they only live inside of his head now as the weeks progress it is happening more and more often he is talking to this little girl more frequently and every time she asks him who he's talking to it's all always the same this little girl that joy cannot see and after a while joy was like all right now this is getting a little strange sir her accepting this or ignoring this and just letting him do his thing it's becoming harder to do the more he talks about her and the kind of things that this little girl is saying to him now according to him the little girl and her grandmother who do not speak were killed inside the house and are trapped there and as if this is not strange enough according to jacob the landlord is the little girl's grandfather and responsible for her and her grandmother's death child joy is already feeling away about the landlord mr hanover and this just makes it 10 times worse so at this point she is really side eyeing him and one evening while he is at the house doing some maintenance he attempts to strike up a casual conversation with joy seemingly trying to get into her little business and he asks so what's your story? I see you wear a ring, but I have yet to see a man come by here. And you speak about your son often. She's honest and tells him what happened and how she's been struggling over the last couple of months adjusting to her new life and coming to terms with her new reality without her husband. And that she had moved with her son simply to, you know, start their lives over. The awkward silence immediately following her answer is the most uncomfortable that she has been in his presence since she's been in the house. He does not say a word. So at this point, she attempts to break the ice by asking him about himself. As for his family, his daughter had run off to be with some man, leaving her five-year-old daughter for him and his wife to raise. And this first strikes Joyce odd because any time that she has spoken to him over the phone or stopped by the home to drop off her rent payment, she has never heard anybody else's voices in the background. She's never seen anybody there at the house. So she assumed that he lived there by himself. He had never even spoken of anyone else before now. And just as soon as she finishes this thought, she remembers the things that Jacob had been telling her about his imaginary friend and her grandmother who does not speak. Now she just decides to test the waters out of her own curiosity, maybe a little bit of entertainment because of course, you know, ghosts and things do not exist. And she does so by making the comment, oh, a house full of women, I'm sure you don't hear at the end of complaints. To which he replies, not so much my wife. One day the woman just couldn't talk no more or she just wouldn't. Hadn't said a word since my daughter went away. Now at this point, mom was just freaking out. She mentions the fact that she was unaware that anyone lived with him and he says they're around before now she had not given much merit to the things that Jacob had been telling her in regards to his little imaginary friends and how they relate to Mr. Hanover she just considered them to be wild tales with a morbid twist because her son is kind of strange he's a weird kid most kids are kind of weird but now she is completely unnerved and she just cannot ignore how much what he is telling her is in alignment with what Jacob has told her. So she pulls out her phone, Google searches the house's address, and after scrolling a while, two articles pop up that catch her attention. One headline reads, 29-year-old vanishes, leaving her daughter and her parents searching for answers. And the other, published almost exactly a year later, reads, mother and daughter of missing 29-year-old woman now also missing. This article also mentions Mr. Hanover as a potential suspect, but having been cleared due to a lack of evidence. Now at this point, her adrenaline is pumping and she does not know what to do. Should she write it out and pretend like her mind is not racing and she doesn't see these things that she is reading in her phone? Or does she hit the home screen on her phone, dial 911, and blow up Mr. Hanover's spot to the police? And this lady decides that in this moment, the thing to do is to basically accuse him of having done something horrible to his wife and his granddaughter. Without saying a word, the landlord takes a step toward joy and she instantly hits her little 911 emergency call option on her cell phone because baby if you kill them what you're not about to do is kill me 
and get away with it. As soon as she hears the operator's voice, she puts the phone to her ear and she begins telling her to send a car right away, that her landlord has killed his wife and his grandchild. She is freaking out, barely able to recite the address that they are at. Meanwhile, Mr. Hanover, the landlord, has not said a word. And to her surprise, he is not even trying to flee the scene. So I just called the police on you. Instead, he just calmly stands there, staring at her yet again as if she is the crazy one. And the only thing that he has to say to her is that calling the police was a mistake. The police arrive within minutes and they separate the two, getting a statement from each party. Now she is telling them how she rents from him and how he is a weirdo and they need to check him out because he said his family is around y'all and she has not seen anybody. However, her young son is saying that his family is saying hello from the other side, that they are no longer in the land of the living and he has something to do with it. Meanwhile, she can hear Mr. Hanover out there getting all loud, riled up and rambunctious as if he is the victim here and has the right to be freaking out. He is basically painting himself as this great guy who saw a young woman in need, renting one of his properties out to her at a great price to help her out despite her issues, to then be treated like some kind of criminal. And to diminish her credibility altogether, he tells them that they cannot believe a word that is coming out of her mouth. She's obviously crazy and the whole time she has been living there, she has been speaking of a son that does not exist. Now at this point, this is hard enough. She is like crazy where? Like my son is literally sleeping right down the hall. The officers then enter her son's room, which outside of the outlandish Batman decor is an empty room. How extremely neat and undisturbed the room is, it is very obvious and very clear that it has not been touched by a child. Frantically, Joy is looking for her son, who she is now accusing Mr. Hanover of having done something to, just like he had done something to his wife and his granddaughter, allegedly. But by now, the officers are also looking at her crazy, the same way Mr. Hanover has been looking at her for months. She immediately pulls out her phone and calls her sister because she cannot believe what is going on here. Like, and where is my child? She is explaining all of this to her sister, who is also a little bit too calm for her comfort. The sister then asks to speak with the officers. And instead of having Joy's back, she apologizes to the officers, telling them about how Joy had lost her husband and her son in the fire and had not been quite the same since. Although she had mourned the loss of her husband, she had not processed grieving her son in the same way. It was almost as if it was too much for her mind to accept and had instead altered her reality to continue to include her little boy. Joy is then taken to a mental hospital where initially she was supposed to be held until her sister comes to pick her up, but her sister had decided that with her refusing to get any kind of therapy, it's probably best that she remains there with trained professionals who can give her help. Fast forward three years later, John Hanover passes away in his home of old age or natural causes. And the home that he once rented out to Joy becomes property of the state, which they decide to tear down. Now, upon doing so, they unearth the remains of a small child and an adult in one gravesite and the remains of a young adult female also buried there on the property, confirmed to be the wife, the granddaughter, and the daughter of the landlord. Story number two the interview. Jose is having a difficult time finding work and making ends meet, so he is elated when he finally lands a job working at a bank. But unfortunately for him, what they're paying him is not quite enough to cover all of his expenses. And seeing all of this fresh money on the day to day is becoming very tempting. It's also a reminder of how broke he is. Now he didn't have that little set it off spirit on him that would allow him to come in, case the place and come back and try to steal all of their money. So that was not an option. But a couple of weeks into his employment, he's noticed a couple of things, a couple of loopholes that might make it possible for him to slide a little bit of money out here and there without being seen. And so he does. He tests the waters by stealing just a couple of hundreds here and there. And before you know it, three months have passed and he has stolen thousands of dollars. Now the missing money had of course been noticed. They noticed that the drawers were coming up short. They just did not know which one or ones of their employees was the culprit. So the higher ups at the bank decided to just sit back and watch and let whomever is stealing believe that 
they hadn't noticed anything. Meanwhile, Jose is getting away with the things in his head and so he's becoming more and more comfortable stealing more and more money as the weeks progress. That is until he hears some of his fellow employees having a little conversation about the money that had been coming up missing and the fact that they now believe that they know who is responsible but they don't know who it is. Now, Jose, knowing as him, was not trying to go to jail. Now, he knows if he quits, that would be a major red flag. And it would be kind of obvious that it is him. But what is he to do? Sit around and wait to be arrested? No. And so he comes up with a plan to tell his employers that he is relocating, moving to a different city, and that is why he is having to leave the job. Which isn't completely a lie, because he does relocate. It just was not the reason why he had relocated. Child, and just as he had suspected, him leaving raised a major red flag. They had already assumed that it was him, but him actually going, it was like the nail in the coffin. They were sure that Sis was just trying to run out on his jail sentence. Now they had planned on having Sis picked up and arrested during that two weeks notice he had given them, but to their surprise, he does not work the two weeks. He gives them the notice, and then he disappears. The bank, of course, gets law enforcement involved who make several attempts to contact him, pop up at his old address, but by the time they got around to his house, he was long gone. They make several attempts to contact him via the phone number that he had on file at the bank, no answer. Finally, they just issue a warrant for his arrest and just go on about their business because obviously they were not about to catch up with him. But had he ran a little stop sign or did a little jaywalking, he will come up in the system. But for the next two years, he has no run-ins with law enforcement. And by now, he has put the whole thing behind him, moved on with his life, thinking that was close, but he gotten away with it. Now, unfortunately for him, that little stolen money, child, he was spending it as he was taking it. And in those two years, he and I had much luck finding himself a good job. So he was pretty much in another town, back to square one. Now, Jose makes a promise to himself that the next job he gets, will be one that will pay him enough where he doesn't have to do this shady stuff and risk his employment and his freedom. He wants work to be honest and also pay the bills. While checking out available jobs in the area, he sees a listing for a 911 dispatcher. And so he applies. He had heard that the pay was not the best, but it would be enough. And the benefits were great as well. Plus, he looks at this as similar to a call center job. Couldn't be that hard. He just figured worst case scenario, things get a little hectic on the line. He just hang up the line and try his luck with the next caller. Within days of applying for the job, he receives a call with great news. He has been granted an interview for the position. He is very excited about this. And to prepare, he borrows money from a friend to get him a nice little outfit to show up and interview in. Promises to pay his little friend back out of his first check. You know how we do. Gets himself a nice fresh haircut, shows up to the interview in this nice suit, looking all good, smelling good too. Ready to impress his interviewer when he is instead met by police who arrest him. You see, during his background check, his arrest warrant had come up and instead of letting that little fugitive fishy off the hook, they decide to schedule him for an interview or at least let him believe that he was scheduled for an interview and arrest him instead. Story number three, Stranger Than Fiction. In 2003, published author Chris Hines writes a crime novel, which quickly becomes a bestseller. It basically goes viral, grips the nation, and is getting more publicity than any of his other bodies of work. For a lot of people, it is the most riveting, most scandalous little stories that they have ever read, and they could not get enough of it. It embodies all of the things that we cannot turn our little eyes away from. Lies, deceit, affairs, murder, just everything scandalous. Now, the book itself is about a man who is obsessed with his ex-wife and actually finds out that she is having an affair with a married man. And one night, the man, while enraged and intoxicated, confronts his ex-wife at her home, kicking down her door and demanding that she admit to this affair. And she is like, sir, if I were, this is none of your damn business. Like, what are you doing here? kicking down my dough. She is denying it. She is telling him he needs to leave. And at this point, he becomes even more enraged because he knows that she is lying. He reveals to her that he has hired a private investigator who had been following her for weeks, shows her pictures of her and this man together. He knew where this man worked, where this man lived with his wife and child, and the room numbers of the hotels that they had frequented during their little late night rendezvous. Fast forward a couple of weeks, the ex-wife is trying to contact this married man that she is having an affair with and she is unable to reach him. Then she finds out that he has been reported as a missing person. She doesn't know what to think, but what is she to do? Show up at his wife's house like, hey, 
I'm the side piece. Like, where my boyfriend at? No. So she attempts to go on about her life as she normally did. And a couple of weeks later, a group of fishermen are out setting up to do their little fish thing and bond when they spot what they have first mistake for a log floating in the water. But then they see what appears to be hair. And so they decide to investigate this a little bit further. And the closer they get, they realize that this is in fact a person floating in the water. Obviously deceased. The body is of John Atkins, a 35-year-old businessman who had been reported missing four weeks earlier by his wife, and also the man that Miss Mamas was involved in this affair with. Upon interviewing his friends and family, detectives find that this man virtually has no enemies. There is no one that anybody can think of that will want to hurt him. He was not confrontational at all, very nice guy, loved and admired by many. And so, of course, they turn their sights to the spouse because, you know, they always suspect the spouse at some point. Now, he and his wife had had issues in the past, but according to her, they were in a great place and even in the process of adopting a child. And so she is cleared of any suspicions. They have absolutely no clue who is behind this. Now, when his mistress gets the news, her mind immediately goes back to the night that her ex-husband had showed up at her house, kicked her little dough in, questioning her about this man. And now, does she think that her ex-husband is capable of something like this or that he would do something like this? No. But this is too much of a coincidence. And so she does ask him. And she is relieved when he very convincingly tells her, like, no, I would never have taken things this far. Like, girl, you cute or whatever, but you're not that cute. Relax. Someone had committed the perfect murder and had gotten away with it. Quite a compelling story. And to most who read it, it is just that. Just a story, just a good book, nice little read, nothing serious. While others begin to recall that the details inside this book are eerily similar to the details of a real life murder that had taken place just three years before. And just like in the book, had never been solved. The rumors about the author actually being behind the real life murder sensationalizes the hype around this book, boosts the sales through the roof. The author is collecting all of the money, living his best life because finally one of his books are selling. And a lot of people settled that little uneasy questioning of could this really be connected to the actual murder? With the fact that authors use real life situations that they had absolutely nothing to do with directly as inspiration all of the time. Maybe he just heard the details and was inspired. After all, the crime itself is not exactly the same as the real life murder. There are details that differ from what they had heard in the media coverage. But what they had not taken into consideration is that details being different does not automatically mean that they are untrue. Now, it is not until the book falls into the hands of one of the police officers who was working that case. And he too, just like everybody else, began to realize the details are uncanny like this is too much of a coincidence him having access to the case files goes back and revisits the details and finds that a lot of the details in the book did actually happen in the real life murder but they were not details that were released to the public and so only the real killer could have known them Police decide to dig a little bit deeper into the background of this author and find that not only did he know the real life victim, he was the last person to have seen him alive and actually sold his phone on eBay the same day that he had gone missing. None of this they knew beforehand. Not only that, they also find out that Chris's ex-wife was having an affair with the real life victim. And they had to ask themselves, had the real killer been hiding in plain sight right underneath our nose and had the audacity to post about it publicly in a book? The answer is yes. When they find out, in addition to everything else that is so telling, that Chris's estranged ex-wife had also had an affair with the real life victim, just like in the book, they are certain that this book is a very lightly fictionalized version of the real life killing. And this author had actually committed the murder, written a book about it, would have gotten away with it had he not decided to boast about it publicly like an idiot. Once they feel like they have collected enough evidence to win a conviction, the author Chris is formally charged 
and receives 25 years in prison. During his trial, they also find out that he had plans of committing a second murder. He is still incarcerated till this day, working on his next book, which is a fictionalized version of the murder that he planned to commit had he been given the opportunity to do so. So how many of them did you get right? Story number one. Could a woman's mind been so fractured by the loss of her husband and her son that it somehow opens up doors that allow her to see more than what meets the eye? Or perhaps she had found out about it a normal way, but things just play out through her altered reality, making her look crazy when she in fact was really onto something. If you guess that this story actually happened, you'd be wrong. This story was nothing more than a figment of my imagination. And I better not see it pop up as a Netflix movie for a lifetime. Story number two, the man who goes on the run from law enforcement and later applies for a job with law enforcement and then gets arrested down to the interview. If you guess that this story is true, you are correct. This actually took place in 2018 in Arizona and happened to a man by the name of Alberto Lopez. Ain't that crazy? Story number three, Stranger Than Fiction. The author who would have gotten away with murder had he not exposed himself in his very own book. Are people really this dumb or is this something that mother made up? If you guess that this story is a figment of my imagination, you are wrong. This is actually a true story that took place in Poland. The actual murder took place in 2003. The book titled Amok was written in 2007. The author's name is Christian Bala and yeah, he really was that dumb. Was this not fun? I loved the show Beyond Belief Fact of Fiction back in the day. And I was so happy to be bringing you guys my version to these YouTube streets. And also flex my creative writing muscle a little bit, which I've been dying to do. Plus, you guys know that I absolutely love interacting with y'all, like for real. I love engaging with you guys. And this gives me the opportunity to do so in a way that is new and fun. I love this and I hope you did too. I really wish that I could give you guys three videos a week, one true crime, one of these, one urban legend. But honestly, because I do all of my research, all of my editing, all of my filming myself, and now writing, <laughs> I just can't do it. Like that is not feasible for me, honestly, unfortunately. I'm a one woman show, no team, just little old me. I'm about to end this video now, but special thanks to all of you guys who caught the premiere and are watching this right now with me. Hey y'all, I'm in the comments. And if you did not catch the premiere, don't worry, mother will be back in the comment section intermittently all evening to talk to you guys too. I know some of y'all gotta work late, some of y'all have classes that are late. Hopefully all of y'all will get a chance to catch the premiere one day because all of these videos like this will be done premiere style. So I can talk to y'all in the comments and see what y'all think and how y'all are guessing in real time. Before you leave, don't forget to thumbs up this video. It truly, truly helps me out a lot share this video with a friend as always i appreciate you so much for spending your time with me and i look forward to seeing you in the next one peace i would do my little peace sign grow but i'm missing a nail and y'all not about to be talking about that in the live chat down there girl all right i gotta go y'all bye big girl you gonna do the intro for mommy say welcome back to mommy's channel if this is your first time here tell them what to do girl oh don't get shy now girl don't get shy now, but you can get off my couch. <sighs> I'm so nervous, honestly. What is wrong with y'all's knees? Okay, you can do the intro, but you have to be still. What is up, my YouTube family? Welcome, Bella, please. All right, mommy, you gotta get down. Oh no, <sighs> let me do this intro again without Bella, cause she really, cramps my style or the more he doesn't come off like a creep or somebody that will potentially hurt or ugh, hurt or i can't say hurt her that just said it <laughs> hurt or shit. speaking as if he's having all two way i was gonna say two way relationship no not the children and if this is and as if this ugh. or did she just dial nine one bella or did she just dial okay Jesus, take the wheel. It's hard out here for a single pet parent to tell him. I know, mommy. Yeah, you're such a sweet girl. Stop doing all that licking, girl. This ain't ASMR now. You're going to sit up here. You're going to have to be on thing with the video. 
without saying a word. The landlord really belly with when he is instead met by the look at blue ruining the thing. And Bella in my lap, they just won't they just won't let me be great today. He's getting out of his blanket, y'all. On my couch, look at him. Lay down. In 2003, published Arthur. Arthur. What? Let me just. It's the wine. Takes a sip of the wine. Kicking her dirty. I can't talk. 